So good evening. I'm Robert Polito of the New School Writing Program. And, and it's my immense pleasure to welcome you to this extraordinary evening with Kaveh Khanum, featuring two superb poets, Terry Ellen Cross Davis and Melissa Castillo Planas. Contemporary American poetry is impossible to imagine without the poems of the multiple generations of young poets who have arrived via Kaveh Khanum over the past two decades. The Kaveh Khanum emphasis on craft, on creative legacy, and on poems that are as formerly inventive, as aesthetically audacious, as they are socially, culturally, and politically engaged, has transformed and continues to transform the art in decisive and powerful and irreversible ways. Founded in 1996, Kaveh Khanum is in its 23rd year, closing in on 25. You need only to look at recent Pulitzers, National Book Awards, LA Times Book Prizes, and Guggenheims to focus their reach and creativity. Also, I want to remind everyone that the deadline for the Kaveh Khanum Poetry Prize is March 31st, with Evie Shockley as the judge this year. Tonight's introducer and moderator is Elizabeth Bryant, a gifted poet, prose writer, who is Kaveh Khanum's programs and communications manager. So please join me now in giving a warm welcome to Elizabeth, who will introduce the rest of the evening. Hi, good evening. Can you all hear me? OK. Um, so as you just heard, my name is Elizabeth Bryant. I'm the Programs and Communications Manager at Kaveh Khanum Foundation, which in sum is a home for the many voices of black poetry and an organization dedicated to the artistic and professional growth of black poets and poets of color. I encourage you all to stay in touch with us, to sign up for our mailing list, which is right over there by the bookseller, to pick up our spring flyer, which details our really exciting season of events through May of this year. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at Kaveh Khanum Poets, and visit our website, kavehkhanumpoets.org. So, we are in the midst of a very exciting season of events this spring and invite you to join us. On, May, on March 14th, so in a few weeks, uh, please come out to Amarachi in Brooklyn for Party for the People, a poetry pop-up dance party co-presented with Lambda Literary as part of our Poetry Coalition programming. The evening will feature brief pop-up readings from Kay Ulande Barrett, Victoria Newton Ford, Danika Kelly, Omatara James, and Denez Smith. There's also gonna be a live DJ and snacks and food, so you should all come. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, Kaveh Khanum will also be active at AWP, the annual Writers' Conference in March, taking place this year in Portland. Come to our off-site fellows reading at Literary Arts on March 27th, and additionally on March 28th, Don Lundy Martin, Morgan Parker, and Evie Shockley will read work engage in, and engage in a lively, stimulating conversation moderated by Fatima Asghar. I would like to take a moment to give the deepest, most heartfelt thanks to the New School Creative Writing Program, to Lori Lynn Turner and your incredible team here, and everyone who has made this collaboration possible throughout the years. Thank you. Thanks are also due to our funders, the Lannan Foundation, the Whiting Foundation, Amazon Literary Partnerships, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts. Of course, a special thank you to you all, our beautiful audience members. <clears throat> now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's poets who will read briefly from their own work before engaging in a conversation which I will moderate. Oh, I also want to say thank you to Langston, who will be selling books this evening right over there. <laughs> so, a founding member of the Black Ladies Brunch Collective, Terry Ellen Cross Davis is a poet whose value for community is evident in the many ways she forges possibilities for kinship, healing, and learning through poetry. She serves on the Advisory Council of Split This Rock, a biennial poetry festival in Washington, D.C., was a semi-finalist judge for the National Endowment for the Arts, Poetry Out Loud, and is the poetry coordinator for the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC. Davis is also the author of Haint, 
winner of the 2017 Ohio Ohiana Book Award for Poetry, which Cornelius Eady calls a book that constructs the irrepressible center of a soul, page by page, plank by plank. A Cave Canem Fellow, she has been awarded residencies at Hedgebrook, the Soul Mountain Writers Retreat, the Virginia Center for Creative Arts, and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. Her work has been published in many anthologies, including Bum Rush the Page, A Deaf Poetry Jam, Check the Rhyme, an anthology of female poets and MCs, and of course, not without our laughter, poems of joy, humor, and sexuality, among other anthologies. A poet, scholar, essayist, and creative writer, Melissa Castillo Planas is a poet of action. In a 2013 interview, she clarifies the personal connection between poetry and movement, stating, Everything I do must have some sort of social justice aspect. Art, writing, even academia should invoke thought and emotion. Castillo Planas is an editor of the anthology Manteca, an Af anthology of Afro-Latina poets, and author of the poetry collection Coetlacue Eats the Apple, which poet Willie Perdomo describes as the mosh pit into which we are accidentally tossed, momentarily lost, and thankfully self-discovered. Her forthcoming book, A Mexican State of Mind, examines the creative worlds and cultural productions of Me Mexican immigrants in New York City. Her short stories, poetry, and essays have been published in numerous publications, including Afro-Latinos in Movement, Critical Approaches to Blackness, and Transnationalism in the Americas. Castillo Planas completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University's Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History, where she taught courses in Latinx cultural studies and organized their first ever Latinx poetry reading and workshop series. Wow. Please join me in welcoming Terry Ellen Cross Davis. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Kaveh Kanam. I will always, always give love to Kaveh Kanam. <laughs> um, and thank you to the New School. Um, and, and thank you all for coming out. Um, first, I want to start with probably the lightest poem I'll read tonight. Um, <laughs> um, how many of you all remember Noun Laters? Exactly. Well, I have a thing with candy. I was actually married in my dentist's backyard. Um, because we knew each other that well. Um, so I'll start off with this poem, and this is called Ode to Noun Laters. Tucked under her pillowcase, heaven is a roller field toss away. The night cut by the sound of unwrapping candy. Silence before each saturated fold is peeled away, revealing apple, banana, pineapple, or sweet tart cherry. Always now, 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 never later, as the moon winks in slick approval from an otherwise cold adult sky. But here yields glory, exploding on her tongue, juice filling her mouth, so much so she smacks her lips, breaking the night's polite rules. In this dank cave she calls a mouth, every taste bud is hollering hallelujah, called to witness how the essence of a thing only softens when stretched and sucked so hard the mouth's roof pays in tender. And in the mouth's wet joy, all parties become malleable, teased apart with teeth, cajoled to reunion by a happy tongue. Candy shares its secrets now, how much sugar, corn syrup, artificial flavors, and dyes until she arrives at its heart, its ephemeral moment, when a thing is the most it will ever be and no more. This is the pulse of the god of pleasure, seduction and destruction in one last brutally beautiful swallow. And all the mouth is wondering is, when will it happen again? So who can blame her? Once awakened, all she does is eat another now and another now until she falls back asleep and satisfaction is the enamel's slow erosion. Now, I would like to read the, the title poem from Haint, which I don't read that often, actually. Um, how many people know what a Haint is? Ah, thank you. <laughs> Maybe someone with southern roots? <laughs> is that, yep. 
Yep, a haint is a ghost with a bone to pick, is how I like to think of it, right? And there's even the color haint blue, which is very much close to this, which you'll see in like in the low Carolinas. People will actually paint their porches haint blue to keep the spirits away with the idea that ghosts can't cross water. So this poem um, is called Haint. No amount of dilation and, su and suction, hemorrhaging and fever could have erased you or the pulp of your carved initials made with the solid grasp of a still forming hand. Science tells me inside my bones you are still whispering that years from now cut me to the marrow and microscopes will read the rings of your insistent story no matter the inconvenient coupling of timing and desire. Even now, when the bloody show disappoints our sharpening hunger, do you still cling, or are you willing to let another call my womb home? So I went from that poem and that part of my life to another part of my life. I'm the parent of two children, a daughter age 10 and a son age 8. Um, so this poem is for my daughter. Both of my children I breastfed. Uh, my son, 25 months. My daughter, 18 months. Um, and I was privileged to have an office at work which allowed me to do this. So this poem is called Let Down, which is what they call it when the milk comes down. The books say that milk let down feels like pins and needles. But when you're pumping at work, it's more like lungs constricting under the crush of chlorinated water. You know, God willing, when she's 16 or 25, you'll never be this essential again. So remember this smothering need now, the engorged breasts, the suction, the release. Know the ache swelling and flowing from you is caused by your hands cradling plastic bottles that your warm, twisting baby is elsewhere, away from you. Know the sadness will threaten to sweep you under each time you take out the pump and you can't swim away from it. You must do this for her. You must stay. You must drown. Now, um, Elizabeth mentioned, not without our laughter, poems of humor, joy, and sexuality. I'm part of Black Ladies Brunch Collective. There are six of us. And so we put out this anthology, right? And it's, it's a little different as anthologies go because there are six of us and it's only our work. But one of the things that was really fun for, for me and I think for everyone in the group is that we picked, you know, we, we selected a poem from another person and we responded to that poem. And so that's in the anthology. So without reading you the poem that I responded to, I'll just tell you the title of it. Uh, my, my good friend Saida Agassini said, you know, I'm sick of, she wanted a, a, a LGBTQ hero from the past. So she made Harry Tubman into a lesbian. And so that's the poem I responded to. And this is called Knowledge of the Brown Body After Harriet Tubman is a Lesbian. If Harriet Tubman had been a lesbian, I would know the brown body had been valued outside of chattel to the point of risk. I would know an ebony nipple spoke its hushed volumes from inside another sweet brown mouth, eager to know its secrets. I would know a brown belly had been showered with a free tongue's pulsing intention. I would know the brown hips of a woman were stolen back for freedom's sake. I would know that brown thighs thunder was enough to make a woman walk into the abyss of the deep south and come out clapping on fire with black love. I would know that this body I own had once been coveted for its sake and its sake alone. How sacred I could hold that knowledge. I could palm it, my fingers deep inside the agent that helped break the back of the Confederacy. So... I will take a leap and read you this one. I like to write about desire. I like to reclaim the language and give women more language for desire. So this poem is called Ode to Orgasms. When the wild abandonment of pleasure calls, trilling its glorious song, you surrender. Forget yourself, respond in kind, moaning an ecstatic ode to the rivers of flesh, the delta, the well-plowed field. This back-arching work results in trembling limbs, shuddering, simpering joy. Not all is submission. You saw this rare bird, whether in sun-dappled bed sudden on a Saturday while children frolic a floor below, or on a sodden tree trunk in the aftermath of a February's record-breaking snow. Be it a quick trice in a hotel stairwell, desire domineering a long drive, you committed, 
flung open the shutters of propriety to pursue this elusive creature. Now grasp its golden tail feathers, leap from mountaintop to mountaintop, gulp that sweet, sweet fleeting air. Um, and so I'm reading these, starting with that poem and the rest of these, these are fairly new. Um, and I'll end with something that is truly, truly new, because that is a Cave Canem tradition, to bring you the new stuff. So um, this poem is called Thank You, Jesus. I grew up in the church, but I am not religious. <laughs> and, uh, but it had an impact on me. So hence, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> when the blue and red sirens pass you, when the school calls because your child beat the exam and not a classmate, when the smartphone drops but does not crack, the rush escaping your mouth betrays your upbringing. Thank you, Jesus. A balm over the wound. When the mammogram finds only density, when the playground tumble results in a bruise, not a broken bone, like steam from a hot tea kettle. Thank you, Jesus. And the pent-up fear vents upward out. Maybe it's a hand over breast, supplication learned deeper than flesh, as if one could shush the soul, the fluttering heartbeat with three words. Maybe it's not so dire, an almost trip on the sidewalk, the accumulated sales total showing savings upon savings. Maybe it's as small as an empty seat on the metro, or maybe, thank you, Jesus, becomes the refrain every time your husband pulls into the driveway, alive and whole, and no one has mistaken him for all the black, scary things. You mutter it, helpless to stop yourself from the invocation of a grandmother who gave you your first Bible. You say it because your mother, even knowing your doubt as a vested commodity, still urges prayer. You learned early to cast the net. Thank you, Jesus. And it's a sweet needle that gathers the fraying thread, hemming security and steady stitches. From birth, you've heard this language. As an adult, you've seen religion used nakedly as ambition, yet this sacrifice of praise still slips past your lips, this lyrical martyr of your dying faith. And just two more. Recently, the last two summers, 2016 and 2017, I had occasion to um, fly to Ireland. And so it's had an impact on me and it came, you know, this poem is the end result. And uh, as you know, Aer Lingus is the flight, is the airline that takes you directly to Ireland. So this poem is called, A Black Woman Gets a Window Seat on Aer Lingus. And I have to say, I do love Ireland, <laughs> no matter what happens in this poem. Enough Ireland, for all your lush effusion of color, Inside me blooms a masochistic loneliness. Give me the screws I know best. The policeman quick to test my yes sir as acidless. Trigger the Midwest. Never on the Bible school test was this. Crucifixion kills, not nails into feet or wrists, but the weight borne upon the breast. You suffocate slowly in your own flesh. As I return to the upright cross of the US, I breathe easier, I breathe less. And I'll end with this one, and I'll say, my therapist said, lean into your anger. <laughs> so I leaned into my anger, and this is called, This Poem Suggests Revolution. This poem no longer consents to play mammy or to wet nurse a seething rage at her own black teeth. America, your teeth have come in, you nip too much. This poem refuses to play religion. A Bible verse will not absolve you, America. If life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness came from the creator, she is about ready to pimp slap you in the face. This poem will not be your bottom bitch, America. This poem does not consent to blackness being window dressing for the diversity brochure of a country where the board of directors never changed. This poem reads the fine print on you, America. This poem consents to be black ink, a clenched fist, pepper spray, and black souls marching on asphalt. Freedom for and from you, America. If need be, this poem consents to double as witness, the dotted I in the missing reparations decree. Until then, let this poem heckle you, America. Let it yell, God damn US, and choke on cotton while fanning itself and the flames. Understand this poem doesn't want to be bloodthirsty. 
it would rather write about the cleanse of a cloudburst than the vengeful force of a water hose. In truth, this poem courts hope like a volta. It wants to turn the page, writing, America, let us pen a new document. Not a perpetual union, but a chokehold removed, as a black throat breathing freely is a self-evident truth. Let these lines be facts submitted to a candid world. And this poem, when spoken or read, let it alter, let it abolish you. Thank you. Hello? OK. Um, wow, thank you. Thank you for that reading. That was so great. Um, such a pleasure. Um, I'm really honored to be here at Cave Canem. Um, it's definitely um, an institution I know well through um, many of my friends and, and my mentors. Um, and so thank you so much, Elizabeth, for inviting me. And thank you for that great introduction. I don't remember saying that, but it's great to be made to sound so intelligent. <laughs> Um, I went to NYU for my undergrad, and at that time, um, I would never imagine reading here, nor that I was even a poet at that time, would I use that for myself. So um, being so close to where I um, started my writing is kind of trippy. Um, so I'm going to start with um, what I've been thinking about recently. Um, that relates to my book, um, Quote Liqua Eats the Apple, um, which is about um, what's going on at the border and with especially Central Americans. And as a Mexican American, um, what is our relationship um, to that, um, our southern border, right? Not the southern border that um, Trump is talking about, but to our border with Guatemala, for example. Um, I visited there a couple years ago. Um, and so I'm just going to read a pair of poems that um, reflect, I guess, my impressions of that. Um, and this one's called Talisman. Hard rain and rooster calls fill the night. On this strip here, at this hour, when even chickens know to stay away, the streets smell like the renegade stray dogs, soaked from three hours of tropical, three days of tropical depression. If you wait long enough, you can hear the bone crushing water. You come here on business. Welcome to Paso Coyote. Transactions and sales felt on the Suchiate. Lives too. Geography and generations, a people divided, a pueblo, a familia, they come to strike deals and a new start in life. Welcome to the third border. Take this young girl, Paola, her brother, ex Mara Sabachucha, escapes, rode the train to Los Angeles, and only lost his index fingers, his life savings, and his dignidad. And now Paola, deported twice, raped thrice. She hides her pills in her shoes. She can't afford another aborto. Maybe you've seen how they've come back, disfigured, beaten, broken, hope hardened, choice cracked. They cross again. It's flooding again. Maybe the jungle will be better this time. Jamula. Smoke wafts up, shrouds the face. It is covered anyway by wise hands and whiffs of words. Rhythmic sozial prayers click suits and then quickly slip away like the incest that escapes through the ceiling. A curandera in black chamula pageantry commands the cross with multicolored stitching and three types of candles. In this place, there are no priests. In this place, just hundreds of candles light day and night, the faith of generations. It is a fervent Catholicism with no need for the church. Here, 500 Indian officials face their beliefs, dance before saints, bring an endless parade of flowers, new clothes, and honor. These are the rituals of their parents, y abuelas, the crosses of the Maya. It is 2 AM, and the pueblo will soon come. Prickling their feet over fresh pine shavings, they take their place on the floor, light their wishes, breathe the holy smoke, until, killed, until candles fill the church like stars feel the sky on a clear night. There is magic here. Um, so a lot of this book is about um, my experiences as um, being Mexican-American in New York. Um, 
And I took a lot of inspiration. I studied um, African American studies at Yale. Um, and part of the reason I did that was um, because I wanted to get a little bit more um, critical race theory that was often lacking in Latino studies or the Latino studies that was available to me. Um, we also didn't have Latino studies at Yale, so that's a whole other issue. Um, and so one of the poets that I was introduced to was Gwendolyn Brooks, who um, I just felt was able to um, really capture people and communities and spaces in the most magical and real ways. So um, I'm going to read two poems that are kind of after Gwendolyn Brooks. And if you've read any of her poems, you'll probably be like, oh, yeah. I mean, the first one's called The Lovers of the Poor. So the lovers of the poor arrive. The New York Times food critic breathes in rudimentary outdoor flat tops, pats the hand of the old tamal lady wrapped in a sarape to fend off the snow, declares these the real thing, authentic grilled pineapple at pastor, Oaxacan mole just like the Corona queens where he arrived the week before. Now they flock to little Mexico, his name, strangle in Espanol, point to the flags, nod at the old tamal lady, this must be it. They say in fitted jeans, custom blazers, Facial fresh, blown bob, they nibble at the edge. Twitter at their travel 40 blocks to 116th, worry about a cab, clutch at their purses, and they arrive. Starbucks and Target and Subway, luxury towers for a community that never goes up. So they leave for the Bronx, go anywhere but little Mexico. It's little Mexico, no accent now, and served in English with white waiters that say tortillas as if the main toffee and Georgia caramels they grew up with are still lodged in their cheeks. They come now, the lovers of vegan tacos and Pilates, and skitty jeans under employed guarantors. They guarantee and arrive, show their visiting parents the tamal lady until one day she moves to the Bronx. They Google that tamales were actually made with pork fat and shrug. And then this one's called the tortilla eaters. They call them beaners, bean eaters. They eat tortillas mostly. The tortilla eaters, they open early, stay late, patting tortillas in sub-zero Celsius, these complaintless quesadilla griddles kept warm with tortas y tamales, vapor rising from the pots in the street of this little Mexico. Being tortilla eaters, they grow strong, spread wide. They spiral out like conchas, seashells with hard shells, y orejas, ears to the ground. Panaderia and grocery, three new restaurants, five years. They bring their flags in karaoke Sundays, paying gritos from 116th to Puebla. Um, and the last poem I'd like to read from my collection, and then I'll read a couple new things, is um, a poem about my father. Um, I haven't seen my father in a really long time, and I'm going to see him this weekend, so I'm feeling a little bit uh, nostalgic. Um, so the thing about my father is he came uh, to the United States from Mexico in 1974, but he doesn't talk at all about his experiences in those early years or crossing. I mean, little bits, but he doesn't ex talk at all about crossing the border. And so uh, I tried to, I guess I reimagine it poetically in order to fill those gaps for me in my personal history. Um, so this is called Shivering. Heading north, no coat in sight, just a letter clutched to his breast. No answer at the door, he couldn't stop. The lake was frozen over, his heart hardened in Green Bay, Wisconsin, 1974. Alone, they tell him there's work, the factory's always hiring. So he joins creased hands, cracked, broken by decades of frigid fellowship he can't belong to. For long days, he grasps at long ropey strands, Day after day grunts at soapy, smelly blocks, cheddar or gouda, he can't tell the difference. Instead, he feels his hands now deep with, with groves. He looks for the window, squints at the new point. Milwaukee to Minneapolis, he heads out again, dimpling. Um, so I just have a couple new poems, um, like a true Cuss millennial, I'm going to read from my phone. Um, so I'm married now, but things weren't always pretty. <laughs> so uh, I kind of felt like once I was married, I was able to kind of reflect 
um, better on some of those times. So this one is called, for all those broken hearts out there, or people who have had broken hearts or a bad breakup, silence is the sound of a broken heart. Silence is the sound of a broken heart. You can't listen for it. You can't soothe it. After the crying, the tantrums, and the who can who whom better, when you're correcting my grammar, and I, with the five degrees, shout back, your dick is small. There it is, the silence. My silence is the sound of my broken heart, that silence when we make love and I no longer cry out your name, or come, or even get wet. I touch my vagina and it has become dry like my voice. It's that kiss that no longer tastes anything but that bitter woman at the end of her life I see myself becoming. Maybe I already am her. A broken heart is a resigned heart. My silence, another form of oppression. It feels like after vocal cord surgery when they said I would talk again in a week, but it took a month to say anything. Every word hurt like a razor lightly cutting me from the inside. I guess I just take longer to heal. After they opened up my throat, every word became important. Every word became unimportant. I learned it is much easier to say nothing, but I said everything to you. Now I worry I may never heal. Because I learned the difference between love and life. You can be the love of my life and still be the destruction of my life. Your silence is the surgery that left me dead on this table. Good news, you can heal. Um, so, not that it's relevant to this poem, but I ended up meeting my husband when I was at Harvard um, doing a postdoctoral fellowship, um, which is a really disconcerting experience because if I thought that um, Yale had problems in terms of Latinos and Latino programming, um, Harvard and Boston itself was um, very difficult for me. And so part of what I did was to create my own community, was to create my own um, series. So I urge you, if you ever feel like your community is missing, to just um, do your own thing. Um, and so um, this comes from a question from a poet who I invited, who was like, how are we the first, how are we the inaugural Latinx poetry reading series? So. She asked me how, in 2018, there is a first Latinx anything. Mija, please. This is Harvard, H-A-R-V-A-R-D, as in never had a president of color, as in doesn't have Latino studies anything, as in didn't merge with Radcliffe until 1999, as in home to just 3% Latino tenure track faculty. Pero no me miras así. We should have learned by now not to be so surprised. The century-old Jones Act strangles a colony into bankruptcy, a colony that is no longer officially a territory, as if libre estado asociado wasn't another term for occupation, as if NAFTA isn't a death sentence, a train bringing migrants to a desert for slaughter. Pero didn't you know, mija? You go to college, mija, mas y mas. More and more Latinas go to college every year, free to fly in the face of those barren wastelands, barren because bodies sink into deep sands never to be found again, barren because these brick walls feel cold without our cultures, colder when the snows cover these fancy steps, like Wall Street covers a slave burial site, making it harder and harder to find my way in these ivied walls. It is a wall, mija. Not just those fences that lock me in or you out late at night, it's a wall between you and me. Nationwide, only 4% of tenure track professors are Latino, less than 2% Latina. You go to college and the walls between us, the walls in our community grow higher. It's not that I don't want Latinas in college. It's just that I'd like you to come here and be able to learn about yourself too, your history, your poesia. So that it's no longer something to protect, but something to behold. I want you to feel like John Harvard did, like history isn't just something you can learn, but something you can own. Like a paperclip, an earring, something that feels like a baby's hand, soft and fatty, warm and comforting. I want you to feel like that here, where 4% Latino nationwide becomes 3% here, where Harvard does it better. Better at saying you don't belong here and pretending that is not violent. Better at saying your literature is not taught here 
as if that isn't an extension of the Americanization programs, those 30 years when the language of Puerto Rico was English, when those laws banned Mexican-American studies in Texas just a few years ago. You asked me how in 2018 there's a first Latinx anything? Mija, please, this is America. A porn star sued the president. That's a first, too. Um, so I just finish with one more, the last poem. Um, this is written, written fairly recently. Um, where'd it go? Okay, it's at the top, of course. Um, I guess the only thing you need to know for this poem is that um, I run marathons, and every year I seem to run more, and I don't know why that is. Or I do know why that is. <laughs> or I'm trying to figure out why that is in a poem. Um, he traces the wounds of my body in wonder. Your pain threshold is incredible. Pain. I've lost count of the number of times I've asked someone to scar my body. I don't remember when it stopped hurting. Maybe I started running so long when I stopped feeling the needle. Look, look forward to that 20 mile ache. How legs feel like knives are carving at my thighs. Your pain threshold is incredible. Threshold. By mile 23, the aching stops. I smile again. Endured again, another medal for the collection. Another memory I'll soon diminish. Like the book publication dates I dream will soon cascade the length of an arm. I realize it's not a threshold. It's an addiction. Addiction, that that same giddiness that marks a new tattoo is no different than those last three miles. That I don't just endure pain, I enjoy it. That I don't just collect medals and tattoos, but insults and critics. That maybe I enjoy depression, a vacation of the mind from thinking about this fucked up world and my place in it a little too much. My superpower and my kryptonite. My addiction to pain is spectacular or spectacle. I can't tell the difference. I think of the spectacle of spectacular violence we are witnessing in our streets. Black deaths as painful as they are public, child murder as tragic as it is preventable. And I think of children stacked like fruit baskets, like Legos, a border, tamed into con a border turned into containment, containment in a desierto where dreamers go to die. The death of dreams is a violence too. It's more than a 1,950-mile wound. It's more than a fence dividing a familia, a pueblo. It's a line, a lie, discarded in production or destruction, forgotten in the containers of our American dreams. He traces the wounds of my body in wonder. Your pain threshold is incredible. Instead, I wonder, are we a nation of addicts? Thank you. Thank you so much for opening up the room with your poetry and fo focusing us as well. Um, and just for all of your work that you do in the world. Um, I'm going to start with a more general question for both of you about the anthologies that you're respectively either edited or were a part of, and certainly for both of you in the community that fostered the creation of, um, of those bookbound anthologies. Uh, so why did these collections feel necessary to you personally and as part of a larger community of writers? And how has having them as completed works in the world impacted your writing life and your careers today? Um, okay, can you hear me? Is it? Hello? Yes. Okay. Um, can you repeat, can you repeat the the first part of the question. Um, so why did these, the collection- oh, feel necessary. Feel oh. necessary or urgent? Yeah, so um, as I said, I did my graduate studies at Yale University and I felt a little out of place there. Um, there's a small Latino population, there's a small, there is a Latino population in New Haven but it's very separated from Yale um, and there's not, Especially when I arrived, there was not a lot of discussion of Latino studies. Um, we had two professors relevant to my field, um, and that was, there weren't many other professors at all in general. 
And so, um, as I previously mentioned, um, one of the things that I was interested in was um, the way in which um, race plays a part in Latino studies or should form more of a part in Latino studies. And there's just been starting to come out some work, mm -hmm. a little bit of work. There was the Latino, the Afro-Latino reader, um, really, that was it when I, <laughs> when I started. And so um, I joined African-American studies um, for two reasons. One, I was interested in um, you know, the intersection between race and Latinidad. Um, and the other was because they were a much friendlier, welcoming <laughs> space. Um, and so I felt um, like I was really able to flourish there and, and have great mentors, so I'm very um, lucky. So um, I took a class with Elizabeth Alexander, mm -hmm. actually, um, about anthologizing. The class was literally anthology anthologizing African-American poets. It's the most, it's still to this day, the most intimidating, hardest class I've ever taken. Um, she had us read an anthology every week. Yeah, like one week it was like an 1,000 page anthology and she, uh, we, I asked her, or we asked her as a class, like is there anything you would like us to focus on, any areas, and she was like, no, just, just read it. And we're like, okay, <laughs> goddess. Um, Anyway, so while I was um, working through that, I started to learn about what was what had been the significance of um, African American anthologies in terms of African American poetry, and through that, I started to look at what was the significance of anthologizing in Latino literature and Latino poetry. And often, I found that um, either Latino poets had looked to and learned a lot from African American anthologizing practices, um, because in the ones in Latin America had not been so good. They tended to just fetishize blackness, and they tend to be done um, by white people and include white poets writing about blackness instead of actual Afro-Latinos or Afro-Latin Americans in that case. Um, and I also found that there was a lot of intersections between the, um, the people who are early on anthologizing Latino poets in the 60s and 70s, and the black arts movement. And I thought that was very interesting. So um, there was even anthologies that were largely black and Latino. And so I started to um, think about, um, again, um, blackness and, and Latinidad. And um, I just asked the question, is there an Afro-Latino anthology of poetry after the Afro-Latino reader, um, and there wasn't. So as a proposal for, as my final project, I, pro I made a mock proposal um, and got great feedback on it. And then being the naive first year grad student that I was, I was like, why can't this just be a book? <laughs> and why can't I just do it? So I did it. <laughs> so you're like, does this exist? No, okay, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it, yeah. Um, and oh, in terms of um, my career, I mean, it really um, influenced, I've continued to work on issues of Afro-Latinidad, and even when I'm working um, on issues, like for example, it's influenced everything. Um, like my latest book, which is about uh, Mexican migrants in New York, the subjects themselves are not Afro-Latino, Afro but they um, are influenced and interested in the African diaspora, and I take a lot from African-American studies in the way that I theorize and think about everything. So it's really been about how can we bring Latino and African-American studies more in conversation, especially for me personally, Mexican-American Chicano studies. Um, that's become the great research interest, um, just generally moving moving from that anthology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know for, for me, being a part of Black Ladies Brunch Collective um, and the six of us, and we all have very different voices as poets, um, this anthology uh, really just kind of came together and came out of an opportunity that the one poet said, okay, you know, rather than me focus on a, a new book for me, let's do something for all of us. And it was a really, it's been a, a growth opportunity for us because just getting a chance to kind of become so intimate with each other's voices and each other's work. Mm -hmm. um, like I mentioned the poem after Saida's poem about Harriet Tubman, mm -hmm. you know, another poet, Tafisha Edwards, another, like I think five of us in this, in, the, in our group are kind of poets, um, five out of six. Um, 
Well, Tapisha Edwards, she took a poem from another one um, from Anya Creighton, uh, and she just used it as a word bank, right? And just just totally rearranged all the words and made a whole new poem, right? And so it were these moments, these kind of moments that it, it had this impact on all of us where we felt like there was a fluidity, there was a flowering, there was this growth of learning of other voices and working with those. Plus the other thing too is the other time that I went to Ireland was for this book. Like we actually went on a little tour and you know read in Derry, Ireland. We read in Limerick and sold out of books in Limerick. People were just standing and they couldn't believe this book. And I was just like, really? In Limerick? But in Limerick. Um, and part of it is that the you know the subtitle of the, of the anthology is poems of humor joy and sexuality and we kind of cover a wide range in terms of sexuality and identity and um it so it gave us a chance to have more fun to relax <laughs> and it was something that felt different for us to focus on that part of us um to focus on you know and there were some of us like oh i don't have any poems that are funny and then all of a sudden the more we talked and we we, we have like retreats so we'll go away for like a, a friend that has a home in virginia we'll go to her home and just sit there and drink and you know take 40 minutes to find something to watch on netflix it's hard when it's six people mm -hmm. um <laughs> and and you know but all of a sudden but the thing that happens whenever we get together is there's a lot of laughter mm -hmm. because we had to create this community because we needed we needed an embrace. We needed other women who understood what we were going through as black poets in America. And it has, it has created this kind of really foundation and this warmth and this environment that nurtures us, but doesn't make nurturing the work. Mm -hmm. You know, because so often with women, that is the only thing we're known or supposed to do. But mm -hmm. when we come together, it, it's really just to laugh, talk crap, and, you know, have mimosas. Um, and then all of a sudden this happened and, you know, <laughs> but we still get together and do that. So that's, that's in one way, you know, we realized that there were people who seemingly were kind of hungry for, uh, something that spoke to them in a different way. And, um, that's been our experience with this anthology thus far. Mm. Yeah. I just want to state for the record that with both of your stories around the anthologies that you were editing and that you were a part of, it's not just anthologizing for the sake of like pulling poems together, which I feel like could potentially be the practice of like anthologizing American poetry or like what is considered like mainstream or like of the canon. Like you are creating the book bound thing and then you're also cultivating the community around it. You're nourishing the community around it. And it's this whole other process of creating a physical community around the work that you make, which reminds me of, in order to have just as much, you have to work twice as hard. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm wondering if, if that's something that you anticipated, or is it something you were aware of, or um, is it something, yeah, that you just found yourself coming up against in creating these works? It's nothing we anticipated. <laughs> you know, we, we put this work together and we said, oh, you know, we had a small press in Baltimore that was really excited to do this. And it blew our minds, like, to go places and women would have this response to the anthology. And not just women, men too. I mean, like I said, and, and so it kind of blew our minds. Like, really? Like, we didn't we didn't realize that in so many ways we were kind of exporting that that energy that we have when we get together mm -hmm. we ended up kind of putting injecting that into the anthology mm -hmm. so there are all these moments of just just straight laughter for me when i read through this and and it is fun to read through it in in one whole one fell swoop you know mm -hmm. um from start to finish because mm -hmm. sometimes you can kind of go go and pick and choose but it is just really a moment of having all of who we are um, and what we do for each other come together. So we didn't anticipate it, but we're really excited and um, thankful for the response that this anthology has garnered and the, and the way that people have approached it. And um, yeah, it's, it's been really hard, you know, it, it makes my heart happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely didn't anticipate anything. Um, I did, most of the poets, or like people that I was like, oh my God, Sandra Maria Esteves, oh my God, Willie Perdomo. Like I, you know, they, I started this process of that book so many years ago. And so a lot of the people in the book were my idols and I was like, they're never gonna respond to my email. Um, you know, saying, would you like to, would you be in this book? Um, 
And so even when the book came out, I hadn't even met a lot of the people in person. And then we started organizing um, a book tour. And we did um, a whole like series of events. And um, when I got to meet all the writers in person, they all came together for all, like, all these events. Sometimes they had, we had up to like 10 readers yes. at one at, at different events. Um, we had parties. Um, and then again, also the community that came out for it was like, like I remember doing a pre-event and they were like pre-orders and they're like, do you have more flyers? Do you have more flyers? I was like, no, I don't have more flyers. Like here's my email information. Um, and I didn't realize that there was such a, uh, you know, a hunger, right, um, for um, this type of anthology and how meaningful it would be. And now, same thing, uh, I teach at Lehman College um, which is in the Bronx and is a Hispanic serving institution. Um, and the students, I teach Latino literature and we do also, you know, do Afro Latino literature in it, but the students are like, can you give me more? Can you give me more? And I can be like, I actually can physically give you more, mm -hmm. right? Which is, is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So going into a, a question a little bit more about craft, but also about anthologizing as it relates to just documenting history in your poetry, which we all heard this evening. Um, so both of your poetry and your work is concerned with the particulars of language. So Terry, you mentioned in a recent interview that you did for our website um, on kavikanapost.org, you sh should check it out. Um, that in digging in your family's background through the phrases your ancestors used and their origins, you are, quote, beginning to understand how that language and the code shifting that came with it shaped me and my understanding of the world and my pathways in it. And Melissa, I've observed similarly in your work, um, which travels fluidly between English and Spanish and slang terminolo terminology in both tongues, um, and span significant historical events, and of course, with your academic grounding in history, um, you're both thoroughly entrenched in these interrogations with language. Um, so I'm wondering what have been your own revelations about how you wield language as it is tied to the histories that you're writing about in your poetry and or what you feel is on the horizon for you in terms of um, writing those histories into your poetry. I know I will say what I what I find so interesting is going back and and treading the treading that water of the language that I heard growing up like mm -hmm. in the thank you Jesus poem mm -hmm. I find so much more depth to it and um weight mm -hmm. and a way that in many times I think people would like kind of slough off the idea that it could anything important could be said in black vernacular mm -hmm that that's not true and uh i am always recording my mother like saying little phrases like where'd you get that phrase from mom um and thinking a lot about it and so what i get out of it is the same thing i get out of reading lucille clifton mm -hmm. there's a moment in lucille clifton's work and it always happens where i feel like she's inviting my soul out to a porch and giving it lemonade mm -hmm. and it's that that language that is is simple on its face but carries so much weight Right. And that's what I'm finding. And as I'm mining the language I grew up hearing, it, it's simple on the surface, but it's so deep underneath. Right. And there's so much that girl smart as a whip, you know, and you just start to think about, well, why are we talking about whips? Mm -hmm. You know, why, are we, why is that part of vernacular? You know, like, why is that happening? And um, just all these phrases. So it's there's a richness to it all. And. Um, I love being able to go back and, and take things that are said in moments of levity um, and, and think really deeply about where that language came from, what stories um, contributed to those phrases. Uh, and I just, I find it really influencing my work in, in ways that's going forward because it's that code switching is happening a lot now in my own work. I've been reading a lot, you know, about the, I've been reading the Constitution and obviously I read the Declaration of Independence. No, you know, and I read the, 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 the Bill of Rights. I mean, like I read all these things and, and now I'm hearing all these voices kind of have this conversation with these founding documents. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I think it, it allows them to have a voice that perhaps they did not have before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like I have a similar similar experience. Um, so like the first set of poems that I read that were um, when I was in Chiapas, um, those, 
they're obviously not in Sotil, but like the sound, some of the sounds and like the, the poetic, like the atmosphere, the tone that I'm trying to get come from how I remember hearing the language going on around me. Um, and just that, the kind of, yeah, just the kind of listening to the kind of quality of it. And at the same time, other poems that are very, very slangy and that comes from um, speaking Spanish with my cousins in ways that my dad would be like, don't speak like that, don't speak like that. Um, more recently, uh, I think um, I'm definitely, the work that I'm doing now is heavily influenced by um, the book that I just finished, which is largely about Mexican, I spent a lot of time with Mexican, young Mexican migrants in New York that are largely involved in hip hop and the hip hop arts. And so their music and that, um, that sound um, to me is definitely something that I've been around. I think it's made me um, a little bit, it's changed my language, definitely. I'm not sure how yet. I'm still, as I, I you know, I was talking to Terry, I'm still working on a new, uh, a new collection and I don't know at all where it's going, but it's definitely influenced um, by that. And then also, lastly, like as a historian, what I've been thinking about in terms so I'm really influenced by like poets like um, Robert Hayden um, and um, his historical poems. I love them. I teach them. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the qualities I think is how there's the, this poetry always has like a resonance. And Lorna de Cervantes, they both have like a resonance with the the past has a resonance with the present, like where you see these these qualities where you see resonances. And so how I can bring that out more in my poetry, like um, for example, the cyclical nature of history and, and how I can bring that out in the poetry, especially as it relates to migration, which is a major um, topic of my interests, my research interests. Yeah, definitely. I whew, have so much to ask you and we don't have endless amounts of time, but um, I think uh, I want to go back to craft um, uh, and a question about vulnerability in your poetry. Both of you write very vulnerable poetry and I feel like for writers at any stage in their career, there's a process of reaching new levels of vulnerability within your work. Like you get to this place and you're like, oh wow, now I'm here. And then it becomes the new normal and you have to peel back another layer. And so I guess I'm wondering what are some of the tools that you use to keep peeling back the layers um, or what have you used in the past that has gotten you to where you are now with vulnerability in your work? I think a good support system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I recently wrote my first poems ever about having been raped when I was younger. Um, that was brought on by, and yeah, I'm actually saying that for once without crying. Um, I hadn't spoken about it. I didn't talk about it. I didn't said anything since it happened. And it got brought about by um, the Christine Blasey Ford hearings. I don't know why that was the moment that it brought it up for me because it could have been I mean it's not like that's um, the first time something public has happened but it's publicity to that scale I think um, I also think I was finally like in a safe space in a safe relationship in better terms with my family um, having good female networks where I felt that I could open up and, and write about that so I think having um, a good community where you feel like you can share that because it's one thing um, to to write and it, it means it's great to just write in your journal but to actually feel at a point where you can share it and it's some of those poems I've actually read out read out now I don't think they're they need more work <laughs> they're a little bit too raw um, but I did share them at a at one event um, and of just feeling that I was in a safe space for that and then I had safe space around me in that, on that panel that I was on that was literally, that was about me too. And so, um, it's a lot of years of building that community and then, um, 
I think there's also having a belief in yourself that there are more layers to peel back. Sometimes I get in these fits where I'm like, I don't have anything else to write about, right? Um, and knowing that there is deeper to go. Yeah, if you give yourself that space. This is true, it's true. I think that's a really good point about being in a safe space and having community. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, there, there are times when I know I couldn't get to, um, I couldn't excavate some of these emotions without having the proper tools and the proper hands around me. I can't let go unless I'm being held, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, and so that is really helpful. Um, and I have to give my, my, my husband of 19 years credit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it always cracks me up, it's 19 years, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> um, a, a lot of credit and, and um, nine months married so I'm just like Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> he's a feminist poet it makes it a lot easier um, but yeah and also I mean even on the way here I was revising a poem about my son and I'm like crying on the train <laughs> like I know people are like who's that crazy lady crying but um but I was crying because I don't, <laughs> I'm always that crazy lady crying um I had to get to what was true in the poem I had to find the language that that rung true it had to it had to hurt you know and I always think of that line from Steely Dan I cried when I wrote the song sue me if I play too long and I and but I was like I it had to hurt and some of the best poems the most vulnerable poems for me have been the poems that have, have made me go back to a place where there is that pain but the pain is 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 it needs the air I needed to have air for me to have growth and again for the language to be true and that's the, that's the most important thing for me overall, is am I being true to this moment, to this emotion? Mm -hmm. And if the truth happens, I mean, I cry over greeting cards. I've cried over, you know, like, uh, you know, trailers for movies. I, 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 if the emotion is there, you're going to get my tears. That's, that, that's a worthy sacrifice to me. So the poems, the language has to be true to the emotion. And that's, that's when I know it's, it's going somewhere where there can be growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just want to reiterate that with with bringing together these anthologies and also cultivating the communities around them and being able to like bring the other voices that allow you to bring your voice to the table that's like archiving our histories like you're not just making a book you are doing the work of archiving histories for the first time um, so thank you both again for that uh, and then going back quickly to um, anthologizing and Elizabeth Alexander, um, she wrote an article, The Black Poet as Canon Maker, which explores the history of anthologizing African-American poets through a deeper look at the life and work of the poet Langston Hughes. Um, and in a quote from this article, Alexander states, anthologies require a tremendous amount of work of a certain kind, and to succeed, they must implicitly tell a story. The act of consolidating and then distilling invites aesthetic and political choices at every turn, the kind of choices that subsequently come to appear inevitable when we read the anthology and the editorial hand is made invisible. And so I'm wondering if you agree, how would you describe the aesthetic, political, and or narrative choices underlying the anthologies that you've been a part of? I would say it was easier, it, like ours, they literally, we have them separated, you know, our moods and foods, our misbehavior, our good housekeeping, our lists and litanies, our body politics, our technology, our divine chords. And so it's like, it just kind of came together. We were all writing about Prince because Prince had just, you know, passed. Mm -hmm. um, we were all writing about our bodies in different ways. Some of us in the group have children, some don't, some in the process of being in the group were pregnant and have children now. Um, and then, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on mental health, which I just feel like there should be even more emphasis on mental health um, for writers and for especially writers of color and especially for women writers. Um, because so often we have to be super women and that's just not healthy uh, for anyone. And so, yeah, it just all began to come together. We were writing about these things and then as we started to, and I think it was the outgrowth of also, like I said, our conversations and meeting and, you know, talking crap and, and mimosas. And, and you just realize these are the things we talk about. Like, how, how are you, like, you know, how are you really feeling, you know? And 
Yeah, it all kind of came together organically in that way um, that we were all having these poems about these topics. But then it was a nice move to group them together because I think it made it easier for people to access in a different way. Um, so I feel like I thought of the poets more as collaborators than I'm like the editor. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, um, I approached the poets as I'm doing an anthology of Afro-Latino poetry. Would you like to contribute? I didn't dictate um, or, um, or, I, or it was open, right? Some, some poets I specifically approached, right? Um, but others, um, I just kind of opened it up. And I didn't dictate um, how Afro-Latino Afro was defined, how, what made an Afro, like what type of poet poetry I was looking for. Um, you know, um, I took the submissions and I based it, the, my selections were based on quality um, of the poetry. I really wanted to have strong poets and I worked on it as well with Nicholas Canelos who is, um, I literally had a very like guiding, Nicholas Canelos like the godfather of like Latino anthologies. Um, so I, I also um, had somewhat of a, between him and Elizabeth Alexander, I had mentors help me, but I really put it to the, to the community. How are we gonna define this? It comes from you, it comes from the poetry, it comes from your work. Even the cover came from um, one of the poets. Um, and, and even the title came from one of the poets. So I really thought it was like, I'm working with you, this is like an honor to do this and um, it was a lot of work, but you know, that's, that's kind of how I approached it was, uh, and interestingly enough, when people read it, they're like, kind of like what, what, you know, what you said, like a lot of the, there's a lot of themes, there's a lot of topics um, that seem to cross different poets that come from various different backgrounds. And so that was really interesting, but I didn't want to dictate that. I wanted to let it, um, come from the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I know there are a number of people in the crowd who potentially have class, and so I just want to open it up um, for now to anyone who has any questions. I, I could talk to you all night, but want to give everyone a chance to be in conversation. So there is a mic right there. You have to speak into it. <laughs> any questions on this side? Thanks again for sharing your work tonight. This was um, great coming out and hearing some dynamic and honest poetry. I was wondering as far as your voices along the way as um, an African American and also a Latina, um, did you have mentors that encouraged your voices? Because with certain um, departments, they can be very traditional as far as poetry and English and those type of things? Um, yes. <laughs> I think always. The funny thing about anthologies is the very first thing, well, A, my mother taught me to read to Nikki Giovanni's poetry. So that was an early developing force. <laughs> um, but two, then I found um, Dudley Randall's The Black Poets <laughs> anthology downstairs in the basement and just begin thumbing through that on my own time. And then by the time I, I hit um, high school, I had a great English teacher, um, Mr. Huntley, who said, hey, you know, I think this book might be worth you reading. And it was Nidazaki Shande's For Girl or Girls Who Consider Suicide and Rainbows Enough. So mm -hmm. just to have him just slide me a book and say, hey, you might, you might like this. Um, you know, that was really helpful. And then, you know, uh, Early on, just um, by the time I hit college, I had a I had a growth, and like I just I was running a poetry series out of a coffee shop on our campus, um, you know, and we were doing poetry plays with singing and dancing and films and you know live choirs, just all of a sudden it just kind of went nuts, and you realize like they were, they, so all along the way these opportunities, you know blossomed, but then there was a creative community that encouraged um, from whether it was at the time what was called the Office of Minority Programs in undergrad, you know, to like the Black Cultural Student Programming Board. There were all these kind of ways that encouraged it. And then Kaveh Kanem, I 
uh, you know, I went to Cave Canem in uh, 1999. And that was the, the time, all of a sudden, it all became crystal clear that I was a black poet and I met all these other black poets. I was like, you are my people. Um, and it was just, it was from then on, it was like, I just kind of hit the ground running from there. And, you know, Elizabeth Alexander was there that, that my first year and, uh, you know, um, uh, Lucille Clifton and Sonia Sanchez and just a whole bunch of people. <laughs> so yeah, uh, there there have been moments along the path where I've gotten a lot of encouragement. And like I said, being married to a, a poet is really super helpful. Even like you know, an hour and a half ago, he was giving me text ideas on order and what poem. You know, oh, do this poem. I was like, okay, great. So I had like the opposite experience. <laughs> um, so. Um, I grew up reading, but not with a sense of like what it meant to be Latina. Like I grew up with a sense of what it meant to be Mexican and read like texts in Spanish and, and be forced to read those and feel inadequate by the fact that my Spanish wasn't good enough to really understand them well. Um, going to college, um, finally um, at one point I was given actually by a white professor or we read it Gloria Saldua's Borderlands La Frontera and it just basically made me cry and then I went into a classroom where everyone hated it and I had to like defend it on my own and they were like why is she writing in Spanish it doesn't make any sense I don't understand it and that's that was an experience that continued for me into grad school so um at grad school, I really had to constantly feel like I was defending Latino poetry, that I, um, that people are like, why do we need it, right? Like, it's not important. Um, I, my master's thesis for creative um, was a bilingual novella, and I was told by my advisor that I had too much Spanish in it and that I shouldn't write it that way because Juno Diaz didn't write that way. When I tried to point out that there were other Latino writers other than Juno Diaz on the planet, then perhaps I was modeling myself after. Um, she repeated the same thing to me the week after and I had to change advisors. Um, so it was um, a difficult path to finding to finding my voice and to finding my mentors. And I found, I eventually did find mentors, but it took a long time for me. And it was in unexpected places. It ended up being um, a white Jewish historian in African American studies who just has my back at any turn. <laughs> and it ended up um, being um, Yale African American studies a, a lot of times. And a, a senior professor there named Robert Steptoe, who had gone through that as a young man way back when, when he was the kind of first doing an, Af he wanted to do an African-American, or he wanted to include an African-American in his thesis. He went to Yale that long ago, and they were like, what? What's an African-American? Uh, not really, but you know what I'm saying. They were like, Ralph Ellison, why would you want to write about him? And we're all like, today we're throwing up our arms, right? Um, so, um, I had to push back a lot, and I still have battle scars that I need to write about. But um, eventually, you do find out, find your people, and I guess I would say be open that they might be in unexpected places. And since then, I've found a lot more in the Latino community as well. I have Latino mentors as well. But the original ones that kind of had my back came from unexpected places. Hi. Hello. Hi, thank you very much for your, your reading today. Um, I wonder if you both can speak to um, how you negotiate uh, the strategies between creating a niche for new voices without being shelved in a niche. Mm -hmm. You know, because so much of, of what we do ends up in a marketing department for the books that we write that may not be where we want to end up. So I wonder if you have a negotiation about that, or a strategy about negotiating that, uh, that polarity. Honestly, I'm just like happy to be published at all. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, with the, I think I did think about it more. With, with my own work, I didn't think about it so much. I was like, yay, someone wants to publish my poetry, great. 
But with the Afro anthology, um, I did think it was really important and really important for the community. And so I felt a lot of weight about that. Um, and so um, I definitely, I mean, multiple ways, right? It is the first Afro-Latino anthology, but it's important for Latino studies in a larger context, right? Um, I also, you know, see it as important in conversation with African American studies. Um, and I mean, honestly, the way um, that I personally thought about it is, and, and as I put it together, as it's just some of the great poets from three generations, right? Um, and they're just speaking to a particular experience. Um, and so um, it's done really well, especially in like libraries, which I think is great. Um, and, um, and, and in the community, but the fact that it's like really like nationally across libraries and even being taught in some point, I think speaks to um, its wider audience, you know. Um, but I did, I did think about that. And I did have felt some weight about it. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think in like like what Melissa said, some you know, in one respect, we were just kind of happy that we had this happy circumstance of this publisher wanting to do this anthology with us. Um, and then it was only after it kind of began to come together and we were at the final stages that that it really kind of hit us. I think, and even now, it still kind of does that. You know, oh, we created something that speaks to. Um, just the kind of diversity of black women in one way um, and gives voice to very human interests and ideas and so has allowed it to reach outside of whatever, you know, categorization people want to put it in, you know? So it's funny because, I mean, black women are human and so that makes sense. And it just, it kind of, it still kind of blows my mind a little bit though um, because we kind of created something really, you know, for us, you know, by us and, and it just took off and we were like, okay, well, you know, everything that we're going through, other people have gone through before too, you know, people have issues um, and they write about them in different ways. Um, so it's, I think it does speak though to a very deep hunger for, um, for women of color to have literature that reflects them. Mm. And that is what, when I get feedback from people who buy it, that's what they tell me. And like, it's nice to have something that, that they can relate to on really all these different levels. Are there more questions? So I guess quickly I'll just ask one question to close. Um, so much of the history of anthologizing American writers or just in the history of bookbound anthology has been defined by racism and segregation and white interpretations of what this kind of poetry means. Um, and I once had a friend say to me that integration was a big mistake <laughs> when talking about um, integrating white schools with black students. And so I guess I'm wondering if you've thought about it, um, what do you wanna see moving forward? Um, do you wanna see more culturally specific anthologies coming from uh, the spectrum of those who have been underrepresented in the literary landscape? Or do you wanna see the definition of what it means to be of an American canon just transformed? Both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Both. Yeah, um, so I teach um, American literature, um, and I teach it so far because I don't think my bosses have looked at my syllabus only as people of color. Um, and so that's really about, and, and I talk to the students about why I do that and right at the beginning, and I show them what is the, um, the course description, which is all about Whitman and Faulkner and great writers. I'm not saying that they're not great writers, right? But my feeling is that generally looking at the curriculum, the curriculum that is three semesters of required British, and, and, and knowing that um, there is no, 
for example, African Americanists, no African American tenure track faculty. Um, I'm the only person in ethnic studies in my department that they're they're going to do okay by white people, right? It's going to be fine, right? So I teach. Um, so what I invite them to do is to go along a journey with me where we question the canon. And we question the canon with Frederick Douglass and Gwendolyn Brooks and Maria Stewart um, and a whole host of a mix of Native American, African American, Latino, and um, Asian American um, people. And that's because I would like to see the, anthology, the American anthology reimagined. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why I created my, my own anthology anthology was because so far I haven't seen that rep represented in anthologies of, of American literature, but I do see it as part of my, um, my teaching and my scholarship to, um, to not to dictate the canon, but to invite rethinking it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's part of the work of anthologizing an Afro-Latino anthology is to help um, rethink. I think it has merits on its own, I, again, as the, the the poet's body of bodies of work, but um, it's also about rethinking the Latino canon, which is overwhelmingly um, white European at times, right? As well, and, and and thinking a lot too about what you're saying about what you teach. And I, it made me realize, like I co-teach this 10-week seminar called Shakespeare Sisters. It's female poets from Shakespeare's time to the present. Mm -hmm. And we keep tinkering and tinkering with it. And I've been teaching it, you know, for the you know, 13, 14 years I've been at the Folger, at the Folger Shakespeare Library. So here we are in the belly of the beast, as I like to say, um, <laughs> and, and teaching uh, students about the poems of Queen Elizabeth. We only talk about men the first like hour <laughs> of that 10 week <laughs> seminar because we have to talk about the male gaze and Petrarch and all that stuff. But then, you know, we get into Amelia Lanier and, you know, Queen Elizabeth the first poems. And then we take it all away and, you know, up to the present, you know, and we're stopping with Phyllis Wheatley, you know, Alice Dunbar Nelson, and, you know, uh, but then we get to Marilyn Chin, and we just keep adding, and we just keep adding and changing it up and, like, moving around, because that should be the canon, mm -hmm. you know, right? Um, and, and Lucille Clifton and Brooks, oh, a lovely love, and just so, there's so much, there's so much, and, you know, now Tracy K. Smith, we met, added her in, because there should be some fluidity to it. The, the idea of, you know, identity is, is fluid in, in this country. I, I, I hesitate to call it America because I just feel like it needs a new name um, because it's really tainted right now. Um, but uh, I feel like this, we're shifting and fragmenting and doing so many things that our literature should reflect that. It should reflect all that agitation under the surface. It should reflect the broken skin. It should reflect the blood. It should reflect the wounds. And it should reflect the healing. Wow, thank you both so much. A round of applause for Melissa Kitsilopana and Terry Ellen Cox. I'm clapping for you right now.